Well, thank you for, for having me um, and inviting me. It, uh, um, it really is, um, you know, I mean, it, it's a, a pleasure. I know what you do. Um, I mean, I see Summerlee and Christine here and Neva and our team from 815. They're somewhere. They're all around. They're there. Oh, they're there in the back. Oh, there they are. Um, I know what you all do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I know the um, I know the some of the struggles that you struggle with. Some of them. I don't know all of them. But I mean, I was a bishop that that drove communicators crazy, um, and am now driving a whole new crew of communicators crazy. Um, but but I do know um, some of the struggles and some of the real joys. Um, and some of the real possibilities um, of not only what you do, but how you are and might provide leadership for this church in communicating the good news of Jesus in the Episcopal way. That, I can't think of a more strategic group to be with. So that's why I say it really is a privilege um, to, to be with you and, and to spend um, the next couple of days um, here I'm going to scoot off this afternoon. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going to uh, CPG. The retired uh, clergy or their chaplains are meeting somewhere near here. I have no idea exactly where they are, but but somebody's coming and get me, and so I'll go and and bring them Across greetings. The river. Across, the river. Across the river, okay. It's like what from uh, the wilderness. Across Jordan into the Promised Land, or where, 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 where <laughs> close, right? I got it. Uh, but to be with um, um, folk who kind of support um, clergy and their um, spouses and widows uh, who have been faithful and who have served long. So I'll scoot out um, and be back here in, in the morning um, with you. Uh, but, but thank you again uh, for having me. I thought what I would do, if it's okay, is to um, maybe just share some, some thoughts about, um, give you some quick background on Jesus movement. Um, my wife said, how long are we going to hear about Jesus movement? I said, nine years. It's just, said, it's nine years. It's nine years. <laughs> I have to tell you, when I was a parish priest, I used to, during the summer, this is before we actually had the Revised Common Lectionary. This is going way back. But um, I used to do these serial ser um, series of sermons in the summer. And, and I think probably the first time I did it, um, our oldest daughter, who's now mid-30s now, was probably... I don't know, maybe 10, and she was going with me for the 8 o'clock mass. She was serving as acolyte, so she was going with me in the car. And I had been doing this series on Daniel, and it was going to be 12 weeks over the summer, and, you know, I would give people homework assignments to do, look at something on TV or that kind of stuff. And it was, this was before we knew the word interactive, but I guess it was actually interactive. And uh, we were driving in the car to, to the church, and, and Rachel said to me, Daddy, is Daniel going to be dead yet? <laughs> 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 So it'll only be nine years, but, <laughs> but, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of background on where I'm coming from and thinking about, and some of the, or, the roots of the language even, Jesus movement, um, and zero in on evangelism, um, because I think that is what you do. Um, you do it already, but, but you are actually staged in some particular and significant ways to help our church engage the sharing of the good news. Um, of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and I think you really are, and I think you know that already, but, but you really are. And then talk a little bit about evangelism, uh, and then ask Michael Hun, who's here somewhere, I have no idea where he is, to, oh, there he is in the back, to kind of lead us in a conversation about some real practical ways that you can actually help the church to do this and model for it ways to do this. Um, I mean, I can tell you, I have one idea. I haven't really figured out how to, now the 815 staff is going to die now. I've had another idea. I thought about it on the plane that, that what it ought to have to do is Episcopalians Tweet Sunday, where uh, we just say we're just going to take a Sunday and every Episcopalian in whatever church, they, if you hear something that touches your heart, if it's a song that touches your heart, if it's something in the sermon that touches your heart, if it's in the prayers, if it's in the sacrament, something that touches you, tweet, text, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, send it out. And we would have just done evangelism right then and there. That's simple. That clear. That's simple. Now, if there's dead silence on that Sunday, then we are re in real trouble. But that's all. <laughs> but uh, it, it, anyway, we may get to that. Uh, but I thought I'd focus in on the evangelism piece. Um, I've seen the, 
Uh, it's very clear. I've been, I've been um, in this church a long time and been a priest a, a good while, and uh, I can't think of a general convention in recent memory that has been as clear about the direction um, of the church in our time um, as this last general convention. I, I really can't. I mean, there, there, you'd probably have to go back to special convention of 1967 uh, to find one that was as clear. Um, and this came from the convention. It wasn't a top-down kind of thing. And in fact, I'm not sure any, nobody planned it uh, ahead of time for that convention to come out and say that we're going to claim evangelism and racial reconciliation as the two things that we're going to do together. I mean, for the Episcopal Church, first of all, look, the two words in English that begin with E that are rarely found in the same sentence are Episcopalian and evangelism. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that just that in and of itself is significant. Um, but to claim evangelism and racial reconciliation, probably two of the most complex things we could be talking about um, and difficult. Um, to claim that, that that's, that's our mission, that's the Jesus movement um, for our time, I think is nothing short of remarkable. I don't think you could have had a task force to have come up with that. I don't think a committee would have envisioned it. I don't think a convention would have planned for it. And only a way I can explain it is the Holy Spirit was messing with us big time. <laughs> and I believe that's the case. And so at, for this time together, I want to focus on the evangelism piece. And we can talk about the racial reconciliation on another occasion. But let me focus on the evangelism piece because you are, um, you are communicators. That is who you are, um, which probably means you may be some of the frontline evangelists in the Episcopal way. Um, I was at, I, I was, uh, the last couple of days I was in Atlanta at the Carter Center um, for a, a conference, um, well, a summit, um, um, where the uh, Carter Center was bringing together um, American and Palestinian um, Christian leaders, heads of various churches, uh, but both in Jerusalem and, and in the U.S., um, to at least have conversation um, about everyone's hope and dream for peace and justice in the Middle East for all of the peoples who are there, um, and with particular attention to the plight of Christians in Palestine um, who are really struggling, who really are struggling and suffering. Um, and I don't need to go into all of the details uh, with you. We all know the stories. Um, but we must continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and pray for it and work for it. But while we were there, we, we did some, I thought, some good work and, and some conversations. Um, all of the patriarchs, the, patriarch, the Greek patriarch, the Latin patriarch, uh, the Lutheran and the Episcopal bishops of Jerusalem were all there. And the presiding bishop of the ELCA, our presiding bishop, um, and on and on and on. And, um, I told Chuck Robertson was driving us in the car with uh, 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 Presiding Bishop Eaton from the ELC. I said, boy, if you have an accident, you can just wipe out the leadership of the Lutheran and the Episcopal Church just like that. Uh, he said, don't tempt me beyond my capacity to resist. <laughs> but while we were gathered and spent time um, in prayer and conversation, um, uh, we concluded uh, yesterday uh, with a keynote address by President, former President Jimmy Carter. And, and, you know, um, I don't know, President Carter's got to be 90 by now. He's, he's close to it. But in the course of his, you know, he, he whatever people's um, political persuasion, whether Republican or Democrat, I don't think anybody would question that this man is a Christian, that, that this man is a follower of Jesus in the best sense of that word, and um, that he has lived a life of, of selfless service um, since being president that probably was as great if not greater than when he was president. Um, and that in many respects, um, his, his peace accord, um, the, the Camp David Accords that he was able to negotiate uh, outside of Oslo, um, really were some of the greatest accords, frankly, the, the most hopeful signs that we had for a while. Anyway, in the course of his remarks, um, he he said at one point one of the significant influences on his life and his journey as a follower of Jesus. Um, he said he's probably the only uh, Bible study teacher and politician uh, who, gets a, who teaches on Sunday morning. He um, said his congregation actually has about 60 people, but there are always 300 people there every Sunday. <laughs> uh, 
But he, he went on to say that one of the most formative and significant influences on his life and his faith and, and witness uh, was the witness of Koinonia Farm in America, Georgia. The Koinonia community was started by, by uh, Clarence Jordan or Jordan, depending on what part of the country you're from. <laughs> and uh, Clarence Jordan um, really was one of these remarkable guys who in the 1930s went to the University of Georgia to study agriculture. He was a deeply Christian guy. Uh, but to study agriculture because he was committed to the work of eradicating poverty, and especially rural poverty. And so he went and did a degree in agriculture so that he could be um, a consultant and work with farmers on improving their crops and hopefully improving their lives. He soon came to the conclusion that, that poverty was not simply a matter of economics. It is a matter of economics, but that poverty is both an economic issue and a spiritual one. And so he turned around and went to seminary and um, went, I don't know if he was ever actually ordained, I'm not sure about that, but he went and finished um, a PhD in New Testament studies, um, focusing on New Testament Greek. And, and the result was that he came back and continued doing his work consulting on agriculture with <laughs> local farmers, but he and his wife and another couple formed a Christian community designed around or set around the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, a community committed to living the teachings of Jesus. I want you to stay with me for that, living the teachings of Jesus. And that community became Koinonia Farms. And because they were focused on the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and really living in his spirit for real, as best they could, they had several principles that they lived by. Now this this was in 1942 in rural Georgia. Y'all hear me? <laughs> rural Georgia, 1942. Because they were following the teachings of Jesus, their community was founded on these principles, the equality of all people. Y'all hear me? Georgia, 1942. <laughs> all right. The equality of all people, the rejection of all forms of violence, both physical and spiritual, Ecological stewardship, 1942, and the common ownership of all possessions. They took Acts 2.42 and they continued in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in the prayers. I think we actually hear Acts 2.42 somewhere I've heard of. I think it's called the baptismal covenant. Anyway, they took that those teachings seriously enough to create a community built around those teachings. And the result was a Christian community whose influence was significant. It was a multiracial um, community from day one. Uh, they uh, lived with death threats um, through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. In fact, when uh, Clarence Jordan actually died, he died in his office um, working on another Bible translation when he died, the coroner refused to come to certify that he was dead. And somebody said, well, that's because he really isn't dead, because he's been following Jesus and he's been raised. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was the quality of community. And uh, Jordan was one of the people that Dr. King would go to, to consult with, even though they didn't always actually agree. <laughs> uh, but he would go to, to consult. Uh, Jordan died in 69, um, but his influence was profound, not only to the Jimmy Carter that we were listening to the other day, um, but another young couple came to that community, um, and out of the Koinonia community was founded Habitat for Humanity, because they were committed to follow the way of Jesus and to ending suffering and inadequate housing for people. I say all of that to say, that I really do believe that people who are committed to following in the way of Jesus of Nazareth, to seeking and striving to genuinely live out his teachings in the power of his risen life, in the power of his spirit, those are folk who are going to change things. They are not going to leave things the way they are. Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I really do believe that, that God really did come among us in Jesus of Nazareth to change the world. He did not come to leave the world the way he found it. Otherwise, why would he have come? I mean, why bother? You think about it, you know, what? can I actually move away from this microphone? Oh, oh good, oh. Oh, <laughs> I was staying there because I thought I had to. Yeah, otherwise, can you still hear me? Yeah, otherwise, 
Why, come, why would God go through all the trouble to become a human being? Look, if I was God, the last thing I'd be thinking about is becoming a human being. Uh, <laughs> right? Which is why I'm not God. But anyway, yes. but God came into the world to change it. And I think it was Athanasius um, who actually said God became human in order that humans might become like God. Not like God in terms of omnipotent power over people. But like the God of 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, God is love. And that's a game changer. And I believe, as sure as I'm standing here, that folk who are committed to following that way of Jesus of Nazareth, that way of God's life, will change and transform the world. And we've seen it in Koinonia Farms, which still exists to this day. We've seen it in the lives that that has touched. I saw it sitting there when Jimmy Carter was sitting there talking to us. This way of Jesus actually does matter. And so the Jesus movement has its origin. That language has its origins in Clarence Jordan. Um, it was Clarence Jordan who he published um, a, uh, uh, um, well, it, was, it wasn't a complete New Testament, but cotton, batch, cotton patch version of the Bible. Um, some of y'all may remember that. And, um, and it was kind of revolutionary in its time because up to that time, all we had was King James. Um, and I think NRSV, or RSV had come online, but basically all we had was King James. So people hadn't really gotten used to hearing the Bible in other, any other language. Um, and so his version was kind of a, it was a wake up call. And he was a New Testament scholar, so he could do it with some academic integrity. And he would do, he did things in his cotton patch Bible. Um, for example, instead of Pharisees, he used the word church people. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait, for, wait for this one. He said, instead of scribes, he wrote theologians. <laughs> instead of the devil, which is, this is fascinating, he wrote the confuser, which really does, that gets at something, the confuser. Uh, in, now again, he's in rural Georgia. I mean, this is rural Georgia. Instead of crucifixion, he wrote lynching. And instead of the kingdom of God, he called it the God movement in the world. Charles Marsh, who was writing about um, Jordan's influence, said, and I quote, Jordan's God movement was the new social order that burst into being, in the, that has burst into being in the life and the teachings of Jesus. And then Marsh goes on to say, Jesus founded the most revolutionary movement in human history, a movement built on the unconditional love of God for the world and the mandate to a group of people to live that love. My brothers and sisters, people who are committed to that change things. They change and things around them change. And the truth is, they changed the world. And I believe that as sure as I'm standing here. Otherwise, why, otherwise, at 63 years old, I should be heading toward retirement, <laughs> which is what somebody, I met several friends in my, bishops are in bishops' classes, and um, there's a group of us um, that, you know, we get elected one year, and I think the year of our election we're in, that's our class for the full time that you're um, in the House of Bishops. And I mean, what it means is it's sort of a fellowship group, and we go out to dinner when we have House of Bishops, uh, very economical dinners, but we go out to dinner. Um, <laughs> and, and we kind of know each other, and we've known each other. And, and the folk in my class, we went out, I've noticed a pattern. Um, the numbers are declining. Everybody's still alive, but they're like retiring. Um, and Bishop Catherine was in my class, and so she's not retired, but she's not there anymore. And so we were down to four of us. I mean, we, there were like 12 or 13 at one point. I said, we like the apostles after, I mean, <laughs> we were just kind of <laughs> dwindling down. And then uh, we went, the four of us went out to dinner at this last House of Bishops meeting, and we were sitting around talking, and they were talking about retirement. I said, what, am I the last man standing? I mean, <laughs> said, yeah, you can't retire for nine years. But, 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 but the truth is, um, I, I believe that passionately that people who follow in the way of Jesus actually do change things. They actually do. And I'm not just talking about just going to church. I'm talking about striving to really live the teachings of Jesus and to actually impact the world from that. I believe that that Jesus movement, that, that's what's going on. In the, am I making some sense with you? That that Jesus movement is transformative not only for the Episcopal Church, but I believe for the world. 
Um, and Jordan actually said that. He wasn't thinking about the Episcopal Church specifically, but he was a Baptist, um, but he was a good Baptist. Um, <laughs> Lord, no. Would y'all edit that out? Because I'll get in trouble. I, I, mean, it's like I, I just gave never a headache, right? <laughs> but but uh, Jordan actually said at one point, he said that um, he was writing to a peace worker who was getting frustrated with the peace movement, not making progress. Um, and the church not helping. And Jordan said to him, I am increasingly convinced that Jesus thought of his message as not dead ending in a static institution, but as a mighty flow of the spirit, which would penetrate every nook and cranny of man's personal and social life. I really don't think we can ever renew the church until we stop thinking of it as an institution and start thinking of it as a movement. My brothers and sisters, we are the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. And the more we live deeply into that, we will find revival and won't be afraid of the word. We will find renewal and won't be confused about what it means. We will find our soul, our real Episcopal soul and make even more difference in the world than we have. And we have already made a difference. That's what the Jesus movement is getting at. And I think it matters. Let, let, me, let me just tell you quickly why I think it matters in terms of evangelism. And this is getting closer to you now. Um, and, and then a little bit about what it is. And then I'm going to stop and get Michael up here um, to get us in some conversation about this. I. Um, Well, I think it matters. I, I, I think, think about it for a second. Imagine how many of us are there? 1.9 million? I mean, yeah, 1.9 million or something like that. Now, those statistics, I can assure you they're inflated. Because <laughs> I find this fascinating. The people who are doing the counting are clergy, <laughs> most of whom were English and history majors, <laughs> to whom math does not come as second nature. Uh, Plus, clergy have a tendency to see more sheep than there actually are in the pasture, <laughs> especially on the Sundays required on the parochial reports. Uh, suddenly, they see two where there was only one. Um, <laughs> so I don't know that that 1.9 is really accurate, but let's go, we'll go with that for the time being. But, but imagine 1.9 million folk, Episcopalians, leaving church every Sunday or whatever day they go to church, and actually committed to living lives that look something like Jesus of Nazareth. We have a disproportionate number of Episcopalians in Congress. Imagine. <laughs> Imagine. Um, I dare say we've got Episcopalians all over the state legislatures, and I know we got them on Wall Street. Imagine. We got them in classrooms and boardrooms. We got them guiding assembly lines. We've got them in retirement communities. You know, actually, we punch above our weight. Imagine if we were punching above our weight like Jesus. Oh, I think we'd change some things. I think the impact would be even more dramatic than, than it is even, even now. Um, and I, because the way of Jesus really is a game changer. And I'm not talking about God in the abstract. I'm going to get in trouble again. I mean, I, God in the, see, God in the abstract is convenient because we can remake that God in our image. <laughs> right? It's sort of like we can kind of, you know, somebody said God made us in our image and we've been trying to return the favor ever since. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, that, that's a God who's controllable, who, who meets, uh, who does what we want that God is. But no, I'm, I'm talking about a God who looks like Jesus. And the Bible is very clear about that. that I mean, it, it's sort of like Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, you know, Jesus is the human face of God. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That, that what you see in Jesus, you're actually seeing something about God. Um, the way Jesus loves is the way God loves. And last time I checked, Jesus told a parable of the prodigal father. Not the prodigal son, it's the prodigal, Desmond Tutu's right. It's the prodigal father. This father welcomes and forgives his child even when the child hadn't repented. All he did was come home. That's why the older brother got upset about it. 
Um, I mean, the, 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 this is a God who talks about good Samaritans. This is a God who in Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, this is the first and great commandment. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. For on these two, love of God, love of neighbor, hang all the law and the prophets. The whole religious tradition is about love of God and love of neighbor. I love the Nicene Creed, but that's not going to get you to heaven. <laughs> right? <laughs> And please, let me say clearly to the camera, I believe the Nicene Creed, all right, all right. <laughs> but it is the love of God and love of neighbor, that love really lived out, that is transformative for us and for those around us and for this world. The di anybody from the Diocese of Ohio here? Oh, there they are. Yeah, Diocese of Ohio had that tagline, love God. Love your neighbor, change the world. It's true. No, I, I, I really do. I mean, Jesus is a game changer. I was at the, um, at the, 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 the most recent meeting of the, the House of Bishops. We were, our spring meeting um, was really more of a retreat. That, no, actually, we had a revival, to tell you the truth. We actually had a revival. We had a good time in the Lord. And um, we, we really did. We zeroed in and really kind of focused on our own faith stories. and. Um, some sacred stuff was going on. Some, some sacred stuff was going on. But, um, you know, we, of course, had to do our regular business meeting at the end. And um, uh, Bishop Nathan Baxter, the retired bishop of uh, central Pennsylvania, um, stood up to, I don't know, make a point about something. And everybody knows Nathan and knows you're going to get a long speech. Um, and and um, I'm sort of in the old tradition of the Senate, um, where you'd have these senators waxing eloquent. Uh, to get you to whatever the point was. And Nathan is a classic, just incredible that. So he got up and he prefaced his, whatever his point was, which I don't actually remember now. But he, <laughs> but he prefaced it by telling a story of these two, two little boys who um, had some ice cream. They were brothers. Um, and the older one took most of the ice cream. And the younger one was upset about this, and, um, but couldn't do anything because his bigger brother, you know, was kind of in charge. And, um, and he was eating more on his bowl than, than the younger brother. And, and uh, the younger brother heard um, the mother kind of coming in the kitchen or somewhere in the area. And he said, Mama, can you come here? So, so, so the mother came on in. And he said, look at all the ice cream he's got. And look what I got. And the mother said, this is a Christian woman. She said, now, nah, now, children, you know that I'm raising you as, as, as Christians. That means we follow Jesus. And they all said, yes, Mama. And following Jesus means being like Jesus. Yes, Mama. And we, all, we ask ourselves the question, well, what would Jesus do? Yes, Mama. Now, what do you think Jesus would do? I, I guess he would share the ice cream. There you go, good. So the mother left. And the older brother said to the younger brother, why don't you be Jesus today? <laughs> <laughs> You see, the, the truth is, the way of Jesus really is a game changer. It, 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 changes, it changes the game. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. St. Paul said, interpreting Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What the world calls wretched, Jesus calls blessed. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the compassionate. Blessed are those who hunger that God's justice might prevail. Blessed are those who work and labor for peace in this world. Blessed are you when you are persecuted just because you tried to love somebody. The world calls wretched, Jesus calls blessed. He's a game changer. His way is a game changer. And we need some folk who will live like that. And that's why evangelism matters. It matters for the sake of the world. It matters for our sake and for our children and our children's children. But there's another reason. And this may be a little bit more controversial, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. Evangelism matters because I want to submit that in many respects, Christianity, like some of the great religions of the world, has been taken hostage. 
Um, it has been taken hostage in ways that don't reflect the way of Jesus. And that if you ask many folk in our culture, and I can't talk about other parts of the world, but in our culture, at least in the United States, very often the Christianity that would be described doesn't look anything like Jesus of Nazareth. Pew Research, and you all are all familiar with Pew Research and all their work over the years. Um, you know, they've been tracking millennials for a long, for a number of years now. Um, it's, as, as a boomer, I'm realizing, oh, this is the group that's going to be edging us out. <laughs> I think I, poor Gen Xers, y'all, God bless you. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's, they are, you know, it's the Brady Bunch, they are the, what was the middle child name? Um, Jan, that's right. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I forgot. Yeah, they were Jan. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. But anyway, it's <laughs> but, but, the, but the millennials are, it's a fascinating because it's just such a big population. Um, and they are kind of a game changer in terms of our culture. And God only knows the group that's coming along behind them. We don't know what that means yet. But, but Pew has been tracking the millennials, and, and you all have heard all the stats and all that. I'm not going to go into that. But, but they did do one study two years ago, I think it was, where, they were, where it was much more, of a, much more narrow focused on unchurched millennials. And by unchurched, I mean uh, those without religious affiliation, not just Christian, but without religious affiliation. And they asked them a couple of questions. They, they did a um, it's kind of a, what did you call it, Sigmund Freud, name uh, association, name association, a word association. They said, when you hear the word Christian, what comes to mind? 84% said that what comes to mind when they hear the word Christian is the word judgmental and hypocritical. Now, does that look like Jesus? Then they asked them, um, how would you characterize Christianity? If you had to give it a characterization, 79% said they would characterize it as anti-gay. Is that really the essence of the gospel of Jesus? Then they asked them, um, does Christianity have anything to do with love? And only 41% said it has something to do with love. My friends, Christianity has been taken hostage, and we must reclaim it. People of goodwill and faith must reclaim the Christian faith because the way of Jesus really does matter. It is a way of love. It is a way of goodness. It is a way of compassion. It is a way of life. And it is a way, I believe, that many are just deeply hungering for in this world. And, and the truth is, many of them don't even know some of us exist. And I'm not into puffing up the Episcopal Church. That's not what I mean. Please don't misunderstand the motives here. I don't mean that. But at our best, now I know us well enough to know we have our best and we have our worst, but, but, but at our best, this is a community and a way of faith where you can come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior and friend in a way that is grounded in love, that doesn't have to turn off your brain, that doesn't have to become narrow-minded, that doesn't have to reject other religious faiths. But that is clear that we love and follow Jesus. For you believe that's actually a market niche. <laughs> We've actually got a niche. We just got to claim it. Um, but the truth is, they don't know we're here. We're like the deodorant secret. Nobody knows. I, I, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why they named the deodorant secret. You know, I mean, you don't know. I guess you don't know the smell is there, I guess. I don't know why they, but anyway, we're like the deodorant secret. Nobody knows we're here. I remember a few years ago, or some years ago now, um, in, in North Carolina, and we were having our travails um, e even now um, with our state legislature. Um, again, I'm in trouble again, but that's all right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I remember when we were probably about three, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago when the Amendment 1 um, changing the Constitution, this happened in a number of states, but where the attempts to change um, the state constitution to uh, strictly, narrowly define marriage as between a man and a woman. And actually, this constitutional amendment would have narrowly defined legal relationships as between a man and a woman which would have precluded, the way it was worded, would have precluded even common law, which had been going on in North Carolina since the colonial period. 
Um, but, but anyway, it was, there was an attempt to do that, and, and I was really proud of Episcopalians in North Carolina who really said this is not the way. Um, even people who didn't, might not believe in marriage equality per se did believe that you don't enshrine um, any form of bigotry or exclusion in your constitution. So that some agreed on constitutional grounds, um, others agreed on, on value-based um, grounds as well. But, but Episcopalians, by and large, said, no, this is, not, this is not the North Carolina that we want to be. Um, and so many of us were able to be vocal and, and to speak out about that. Anyway, there was a campaign, and I think some of you will remember this. Uh, there was a campaign called Vote Against, which was um, intended to, wh what was going on was it was actually gathering young adults. Um, it, was, it was this millennial crowd, really. It was gathering them um, to vote against, and what people were doing was they were taking pictures of themselves, or getting pictures made, and they would be in these t-shirts that had vote against on it. And it was like going out on social media networks. Well, <laughs> the communication folk in the Diocese of North Carolina kept trying to get me to go on and get my picture taken. And I have to admit, I was, I was resi I kept putting, I kept, oh, I got, I got to meet with the standing committee. Now, you had to know that was a tale, because <laughs> why would I want to meet with the standing committee rather than, but, but, you know, I was, I kind of like was slowing down. And part of it was, there was a part of me, I have to admit, was thinking, I'm the bishop of North Carolina. Am I supposed to be, is that really appropriate for me to, you know, there was a part of me that was going, is that the appropriate role? Because I'd send out a message, you know, I'm not sure. I wasn't sure. I was kind of conflicted. I mean, not deeply, I didn't lose any sleep, but, but it was, you know, I was trying to figure it out. And so finally, I don't know, they got to me in a weaker moment and I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll just do it. So uh, we went on a Sunday afternoon, I think it was, it was a Sunday afternoon. We had been involved in a forum um, around the Amendment 1 um, at one of the churches. And uh, there was a gathering where they were doing this at a, a brewery in, in Durham. Um, and uh, we got there, and it turned out the uh, owner of the brewery was an Episcopalian who was a member of the church I had been at that morning. And I said, my brother, I didn't see you at church this morning. <laughs> I, just, uh, I said, I look forward to seeing you next time I'm there. And I, he was, but anyway, um, we, we <laughs> I don't know if he's actually gone since then, but I tried. <laughs> but uh, so we got there, and you know, people were taking the pictures and all stuff. And we walked in, and three or four of us were clergy and had collars on, um, you know, and big cross, you know, Episcopalians have crosses. Now, we have, Episcopal bishops have these little crosses, and then we, we hide them anyway. So, but we have these cute little crosses. The Lutheran, I was looking at the Lutheran PB's, her, her cross. I said, I got cross envy. I mean, that is, some, <laughs> that is, that is a serious cross. Um, but anyway, we go in there with crosses, and we went in, and we literally walked through the door. I remember going through the door, and it's a huge brewery. There had to be 200-some-odd people in there. We went through the door, and the place fell silent. And I remember saying to Michael Hunt, I think it was, I said, what just happened? And he said, I think we walked in here. And I said, wow, this is deep. I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. Anyway, we went, went on in, and uh, everybody was really wonderful. You know, people were having their brews and getting their pictures made, and, but it was all part of the campaign to oppose Amendment 1. And so we went and took our pictures, and we went out, and I think some of the others were having some beer. Michael and I went out to get um, some barbecue. There was a barbecue truck out front, a food truck. And, and so we went out to get some barbecue, and the guy, there was a guy in front of us um, who told the people who were serving the food, I'm buying theirs. I said, no, no, you don't have to do that. He said, you don't have to be here because Christians don't support us. In fact, they hate us. My brothers and sisters, we must proclaim a way of being Christian that looks something like Jesus, that really does love like Jesus, that really does care like Jesus, it really does give and forgive and seek to live like Jesus. And believe it or not, that's a game changer. And it's news. Now I'm getting into your business. <laughs> <laughs> because th I've been trying to figure out why the Pope is Pope Francis? Why is his brother so popular? I, I like him. This is my kind of Pope. I mean, now for an Anglican to be saying that, this is my kind of Pope. Um, can you imagine Henry VIII? This is my kind of Pope. Right? But anyway. Uh, but this brother is. Now, you got to understand, he's the Pope. And, you know, don't expect him to be not the Pope. He's going to have to be the Pope in some respects. Um, but, 
but but he is the pope. Um, and, and but but he does things. I mean, he's making news. But I've been watching. He's making news. He's not doing anything. <laughs> I mean, first of all, he doesn't eat in the papal apartments. He eats in the cafeteria. And that was news. Well, why was that news? Oh, popes live in resplendent glory and pleasure. And he ate like the rest of us. Oh, like Jesus, who had nowhere to lay his head. And that was news. Then he doesn't get the big limos and wrote, wrote in a Renault or something? I said, nah. Fiat. In a Fiat? Oh, that's really not a poor car, but okay. I'll go. But, but it is a step down from a limo. I mean, for a pope, I suppose it's a step down. Uh, and that was news. Then on Good Friday, I, was, I picked up the Wall Street Journal. I don't want you to be impressed. I don't read the Wall Street Journal normally, <laughs> but, but it was the only paper that was actually there. So I picked it up. And there on the, on the cover of the Wall Street Journal was a picture of the pope. Um, he was washing feet in, in Rome. And remember, Europe has been struggling over issues of refugee resettlement and immigration, some of the same issues that we're dealing with, but they've been struggling with. And he was washing the feet of Muslim refugees. Sounds like Jesus to me. And it was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It was news. And I mean, you can keep going on. This guy keeps making news just for doing things that actually look like the kinds of things Jesus would do. I mean, he actually, you got a feeling this dude really does love and like people. And that's news. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a feeling that's because Christianity has been hijacked. And he's helping us reclaim the center of this faith again. It's one that's grounded in love and compassion that's grounded in Jesus. And I believe in evangelism that helps to spread that and to share that is a major contribution to the world. So let me, let me, let me bring this to a conclusion. And, and um, I was, um, somebody had asked me, how do you define evangelism? And I said, well, Mary Palmer, who is, y'all know Mary? From Diocese of Texas, you know Mary. Um, I really think Mary has given us a way forward, one of the critical ways forward um, in terms of evangelism is sharing the faith. Uh, but it's a sharing that is as much listening to the faith stories and journeys of others as it is sharing our own. And it's that relational listening and sharing and journeying with another on their journey that's really the heart of evangelism. Because see, evangelism is not about um, I've got this theory. I really haven't fleshed it out enough, but, but let me just, it's just a teaser right now because I need to work it up a little bit. But I'm beginning to look at the parable of the sower. Remember that one? A little bit differently. Uh, where, you remember the parable of the sower, the one, y'all, do y'all remember the parable of the sower? Do I have to go? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, you know, it's the one where the, Jesus says, you know, the farmer goes out and he throws the seed and some of it lands on rocky soil, some of it lands on that superficial and, it, you know, the birds eat it and all that kind of stuff. But some of it lands on good soil. But clearly different contexts get a different response. That's basically it. What's fascinating to me about the parable, and it's Donna, and I don't quite know what to do with this one completely, is that the farmer's job is to, is to spread the seed, not to determine the outcome. Evangelism is about sharing the word, spreading the seed, but not to determine the outcome. What God and that person do is between God and that person. That's a different way of it. Because see, this is not about filling up our churches. It may do that, but that's, but that's not the reason for it. The reason for it is that seed of the word of God actually changes the world. It actually makes a difference. And if it helps somebody on their journey into a deeper relationship with God, however that journey takes them, praise God. It is not our job to determine the outcome, but to cast the seed. And Mary has gotten a handle on that. I remember Episcopalians, we were doing it for two years now, I guess, um, in North Carolina. And it was fascinating to me to have Episcopalians um, I mean, I've been bishop there 15 years, and I've gone to a lot of vestry meetings. And I, anyway, gone to a lot of vestry meetings. <laughs> I thought when I was elected bishop, I said, oh, I don't have to go to vestry meetings anymore. <laughs> Oops. Um, but, 
But, you know, I, I, I can tell you over the years, I mean, the, they, the meetings got a little bit better. We got a little bit more focused on the mission of the church and beyond the fixing the boiler and the roof and, and that, all of which has to be done. But, but we were able to get a little bit beyond that. I said, you really don't need the bishop here for that discussion. But anyway, um, but I can tell you after um, we had engaged sharing our faith, there were like a thousand people that first go around who did it, who came to the various meals and sat. Um, and it's set up, it's done the way, I, Episcopalian, we're not God's frozen, we're God's introverted people. <laughs> that's who we are, that, that's really us, and we're kind of shy and polite. I mean, that, that's, that's, I mean, I, I'm born and bred Episcopalian, but I'm probably an anomaly in that respect. <laughs> but, but most of, but we as a church, we tend to be, we're not pushy people. We're, that's, not, that's not our way, and I don't think we need to pretend to be that. We, we need to be who we are. Um, but, but, but it occurred to me that, that, that Mary has actually found a way for God's shy people to share their story in ways that are authentic to them and that are genuine and that matter. I mean, I love it. Do y'all know how it works, you know, with the little deck of cards? Let's see, Episcopalian cards. Unfortunately, you don't have any whiskey with them, but, but, but cards and... <laughs> But little deck of cards and you pick out the question you want to answer. And they're not like, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord? And say, you know the difference between Jesus and Jesus. Uh, <laughs> that too, it's, 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 it's not that kind of, have you been born again? Have you been saved? Have you been washed in the blood? You want to scare Episcopalians to death. Ask them that. <laughs> but but they're, the kind of questions, can you think of a time where you actually went to a church and, and something inside that happened? <laughs> That's real. <laughs> Can you think of a person who impacted your life and changed it and you kind of saw something of God in there? I mean, it's those kinds of, that elicit what's really deep within, what's already in, in ways that are authentic. And the genius of it is the approach is, you're in a small group and the evangelism is as much listening to the stories of others in non-judgmental ways as it is sharing your own. That's evangelism. It is both listening and sharing and journeying with and letting God do the rest. So, got interviewed by the New York Times. Thank you, Neva, I've really enjoyed that. Um, anyway, <laughs> actually it was okay, it was uh, it's, uh, and I mean, it was very nice. Oh, that's why I'm being taped. It was a wonderful experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was really interesting when the article finally came out. I think it came out a month or two later uh, after the interview, I think. And, um, I, you know, I talked about evangelism and racial reconciliation is kind of where we were going. And we talked, we actually talked in some depth about that. I, what I didn't expect was how the reporter translated the word evangelism. When I looked at the article, and I, I think she was on to it. She didn't use the word evangelism. She may have at some point, but she didn't use the word evangelism. She used the word sharing the message of Jesus. I said, well, that's pretty good, actually. I, I could work with that. That's pretty good. At its deepest root, the sharing and listening is a sharing of the message of Jesus, both in what is said and what is lived. And that makes all the difference. And you are the communicators of the Episcopal Church. And at your deepest level, your calling is not just to report the news of the church, but to report the good news of Jesus that gets lived in the church and in the world. And those stories touch lives and can change lives. And maybe our task is just to figure out how to tell the story, both to those who have already heard it, but to that generation that was in that brewery in Durham for whom the good news is actually new news. Billy Sunday, great revivalist, and I'm going to stop now. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Billy Sunday, great revivalist. Um, not sure I didn't agree with his theology, but, but, but anyway, he was a great revivalist. Um, uh, turn of the last century. Um, was reputed, to, he actually did say it. Um, I've actually verified the quote. Um, I've heard it for years, but he actually did say, this is like early 20th century. He said, heaven help the rest of Protestantism if the Episcopal Church ever wakes up. <laughs> Your job is to wake us up and tell the story. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs>